This might date me, but I remember when I was a kid, there used to be these old Listerine commercials from the 1990s. <laughs> you realize you're younger than me, right, Janine? Tell me, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, the ones that would talk about the perils of gum disease. Oh, yeah, yeah. The perils of gingivitis. <laughs> exactly. But if you're going to bring up 90s commercials, how do you not go with the Budweiser frogs or Mentos, the <laughs> fresh maker? I don't know. I guess gingivitis stuck out in my mind because it really did sound crazy scary to little Janine. <laughs> yeah. But to be fair, if it doesn't scare you now, you're probably not seeing your dentist enough. Well, I think that what always got me was that it was such a scary sounding name. I didn't learn that itis just meant inflammation until medical school. I'm still trying to see where you're going with this one. Well, after our last discussion about COPD, Carl and I talked about how to classify it. We talked about how symptoms matter, but population level outcomes matter too. And they don't correlate as well as we might like. Sure. And what's kind of cool is that inflammation is common to both disease. Oh, God, I think I know where you're trying to go with this. <laughs> exactly. Uh, inflammation. <laughs> Itis. That's awful. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Not our strongest intro, though. But it got the job done. Speaking of getting the job done, Steve, steroids. They make inflammation <laughs> go away. So, so logically, they should improve COPD. <laughs> so it might seem that way, but the way that we've looked at steroids and COPD actually hasn't always been that straightforward. Really? I feel like it's almost standard that with a COPD exacerbation, you get five days of steroids and then the waiting game to see if a person feels better. But even as recent as your beloved 90s, Janine... Using steroids wasn't even the standard of practice. Ah, so the intro works in two ways. No, 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 no. There is no <laughs> salvaging that, Janine. You just got lucky here. Okay, fine. <laughs> then take us through what we're going to be talking about today. Okay. So to start off, lesson one, when did we start using steroids in COPD? And what took us so long? AKA, how effective are they? And number two, what's this five-day course and why is it a standard? Lastly, number three, should we start with IV for that extra oomph? Or is oral just as good? So surprising, it'll take your breath away. Oh my god, stop. <laughs> Okay, get pumped. Wait, what's that? Let's dive deeper into the mad world of steroids and COPD. I'm Janine Knudsen. And I'm Steve Lou. This is Mind the Gap, a Core IM podcast with the support of Clinical Correlations. Our show today was peer reviewed by Melissa Lesko, a pulmonologist at MMU. So let's talk steroids and COPD. More specifically, COPD exacerbation. To recap, let's review the criteria for a COPD exacerbation. One, a change in baseline dyspnea. Two, a change in baseline cough. Three, a change in sputum quantity or purulence. So having two out of those three suggests an exacerbation of COPD. Moving back to treatment, if we've known COPD is pretty much an itis for like 100 years, what took us so long to use the world's greatest anti-inflammatory agent? To be fair, the side effects of steroids like hyperglycemia and increasing risk of infection aren't exactly things you can ignore. In fact, most of the studies we're going to talk about today purposefully didn't include patients with an active infection. That may be an obvious point to some, but we mention it because... How often have you seen the admission for, quote, rule out pneumonia versus COPD exacerbation? Only to see the poor person treated for both of these diseases. They get steroids with just a dash of Lasix to hedge against heart failure exacerbation. Man, that's like the billing department's golden goose. And I guess the corollary to this is with the liver. Since we can't seem to stop talking about the liver. It's so awesome. Um, so yeah, in alcoholic hepatitis, there's this ever controversial use of steroids. Well, for the lungs, there's been a lot of controversy too, especially in the 90s when they started to study steroids and COPD. And that might explain why the first RCT published in 1999 only had 56 participants. And how do you get a reliable effect size from that? <laughs> well... Yeah, don't. <laughs> okay, well, that study showed that there was an improvement between 14 days of prednisone versus placebo. And that sounds pretty great, right? Uh, the first RCT here is a positive one. But it comes with caveats. Despite improvement in FEV1 and shorter length of stay, patient outcomes didn't change six weeks down the line. And that's a little frustrating. It's a trend that we see throughout the treatment of COPD. Yeah, treatment unfortunately doesn't correlate to long-term improvements in mortality or disease progression. Sure, but that doesn't stop them from having a second larger trial. Uh, this happened also in 1999, and it's called the SCOPE study. 
That's scope with two C's. This one was a lot bigger. 271 vets got either an eight-week course of steroids, a two-week course, or placebo. And here again, they're going to show steroids improved outcomes. Patients in either steroid group did much better than placebo. Well, what about the difference between two and six weeks of steroids? Uh, let's come back to that. Uh, first, we should actually explain what we mean by improvement. Sure. So let's start by defining improvement. What we mean by that is actually a lack of failure. That's a really strange way to say a double negative. Yeah, my English teacher would not be proud. (laughs) Um, So what we're trying to avoid here is treatment failure, which typically refers to death, intubation, readmission, or escalation of treatment. But didn't we just say that there isn't a difference in mortality between steroids or no steroids? Yeah. So for the studies we talked about, it actually ends up being one of the other three things. Okay. Obviously, intubation, readmission, or escalation of treatment matter. But whenever we talk about the utility of medical treatment, we'd like to see an improvement in mortality too. So not surprisingly, a lot of other folks tried to do the same study, but with varying designs. Mm. And the folks at Cochrane sat down and reviewed what they thought were the nine best trials. And they found... Steroids reduce the risk of treatment failure by about 50%. With a number needed to treat of just nine. But again, mortality and ICU length of stay aren't going to get changed. Darn. Yeah. Though the total length of stay did come down by one to two days for you QIPS folks out there. I, I, I guess fewer hospitals days is probably better for patients anyway. Fortunately, the patients getting steroids didn't necessarily get more secondary infections, although they did see more hyperglycemia. So how many days should we treat for if we're going to weigh pros and cons? Well, pretty much as soon as we started using steroids to treat COPD, researchers began asking exactly that question. How long is too long? Look no further than the study we just cited for proof. Yeah, let's come back to the SCOPE trial. That's with two Cs. (laughs) The two-week versus eight weeks of steroids trial. They found no difference in outcomes, right? Longer is not better. But that didn't convince everyone. For a few decades, the numbers that people were using were all over the place. Patients would get anywhere between a steroid shot in the ED to a eight-week taper. And for pretty much two decades, the gold guidelines reflected this, stating that the standard of care was for a 10- to 14-day course. In fact, the Europeans still say this. Europeans. <laughs> <laughs> and then everything changes when the reduced trial comes out. Wow, talk about a trial naming genius. You know, it really is well named. Well, it stands for Reduction in the Use of Corticosteroids and Exacerbated COPD. And we're just completely going to ignore how much mental gymnastic <laughs> that takes to get reduced. Yeah, this 2013 study study was a non-inferiority trial. And yeah, you know, someday we're going to have to come back to non-inferiority trials and their pitfalls. Not today, Steve. Not today. Someday. That was published in JAMA looking at five days versus 14 days of prednisone for COPD. And remember, at this point, because of gold, 14 days is the standard of care. And we're talking 40 milligrams of oral prednisone daily. And we'll also get to PO versus IV in a second. For treatment of COPD exacerbation. They also received the other, quote, standards of care, including anabolic Antibiotics, very debatable. <laughs> inhaled steroids, anticholinergics, and beta agonists. And they showed at six months. No difference. Your turn to interrupt. That okay. Time. Um, so just over a third of both patient groups had COPD exacerbations within six months. And as much as I'd be happy about that conclusion that more steroids aren't better, the overall treatment success rate of 60% is pretty sobering. Definitely. These are some sick people, and most have moderate to severe COPD at baseline, and 92% required hospitalization for their COPD exacerbation. And this trial alone convinced the folks at Gold to update their guidelines to suggest a duration of therapy no more than five to seven days. Wait a minute. Where the heck did that seven days come from? (laughs) I'm actually not sure about that, because they don't cite any other papers for this new recommendation. Literally, it's just this one trial. Maybe that explains why the Europeans are so reluctant to climb aboard. So, So then what about our last learning point, oral versus IV steroids? After all, if we're going to be basing our practice on reduces protocol, we actually should be using oral steroids like they did. It does make some sense after all. Oral and IV steroids have the same bioavailability. Not surprisingly, Gold suggests that oral and IV steroids are equivalent. But this kind of feels like something we say more than we practice. After all, who hasn't been tempted to start IV steroids on a patient that just hasn't gotten better fast enough? And this point is a bit tougher to tease out. IV and PO steroids are thought to have similar rates of onset. Yeah, and I guess we give side eye to practitioners that use IV over PO. That's not a thing. What is side, <laughs> side eye? eye. <laughs> Lots of side eye. 
At equipotent doses, the data show no quantitative differences in outcomes. Yeah, in the same way, 14 days isn't really worse than five. We just think giving less medication is better. Because values. Would you want to be tethered to an IV pool or from a systems perspective, induce more cost? Some value-based medicine for y'all. Uh-huh. Or is it an unsaid notion that changing from IV to PO means that things are getting better and we're moving forward with our patient's care? Sure. So maybe it's a medical philosophy point. But the counterpoint can be made that if a person can't take PO, maybe IV is better because, say, they're in respiratory distress. Or maybe they actually do have heart failure and they have gut edema, leading to the compromise of bioavailability due to poor gut absorption. So maybe the thing to take away here is with IV versus PO antibiotics or with the length of therapy, there may not be an exact answer. And you need to ask yourself what matters in how you make your decision. Because it's not just about the data. It's about the practice of medicine. COPD exacerbations have a drastic impact on quality of life. To put it in sobering numbers, 10% of patients with exacerbations never return to baseline within three months of an exacerbation. So it's all the more important for us to recognize the severity of this disease and to put real thought into it. So to recap, we started using steroids in the early 90s, finally developing the data to support it by the turn of the century. These early studies used longer-term steroids until 2017 when a five- to seven-day course became guideline standard. But debate still exists, like with PO and IV steroids, which have equivalent outcomes. It's up to you. Which one are you going to choose? In summary, COPD exacerbations have a huge impact on the morbidity and mortality of our patients, increasing our onus to seriously consider the implications of our treatments. Hopefully you learned a little about the data behind treatment for COPD. And hopefully it helped a little bit to understand how we got from there to here. So we know that we went kind of quickly through the data. And arguably, not as in-depth as some might like. So as always, we want to encourage you to check out the data too. Take a look at the links below the podcast on the Clinical Correlations website so you can take the time to judge the data for yourself and sound smart on rounds. Super smart. After all, this is a podcast talking about those gaps in our knowledge because you only heard it the one time. So if you really want to feel confident in the data, take the time to pick it apart yourself. And if there are any other topics you'd like to hear us discuss, please let us know. I'm Steve Liu. And I'm Janine Knudsen. And remember, mind the gap. Thanks for listening. Disclaimer. Opinions in this podcast are our own and do not represent the opinions of NYU or other affiliated institutions. Please do not use this podcast for medical advice, but instead consult with your health care provider. And you need to ask yourself what matters and how you make your decision. Don't come on. <laughs> Only you can prevent forest fires. It's like a sci-fi, like only you can change the world. Yeah. Wait, do it again. Do it again. What if I told you that you can support your blood pressure and healthy CoQ10 levels with two chews a day? The new Super Beats Heart Chews Advanced is now supercharged with CoQ10. That's like getting CoQ10 for free. Our powerful blend of beetroot, grapeseed extract, and CoQ10 supports your cardiovascular health. Visit RadioBeats.com and find out how you can get a free 30-day supply on bundles and save 15% with the promo code DEAL. Without the ones like you who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional-grade industrial supplies. Count on real-time product availability and fast delivery. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.